Welcome you all to Tea Time. This year it's Amy Team Time. Amy, the Alberta Machine Intelligence Institute. We're happy to enlarge our summer project, our summer Tea Time, to include Amy people. And uh, we hope to exchange a lot of ideas, communicate things, and have fun. And I want to tell you right now, since I'm the first speaker, that it's a friendly audience. <laughs> And, uh, you know, we want to have uh, interesting ideas and we can explore things, possibilities like today. Today I'm going to talk about something that's, that's um, really quite different for me and new. And so I've, uh, I've decked it out with a colorful introduction slide. And, uh, and so it's new way of thinking about the mind, about mental architecture, and it's really, it's a, it's a, I just want to show you two architecture picture slides, and, uh, and I want you to think with me about this way of thinking. I think it's a, it's a way of thinking that I want to explain it to you, and it absolutely is kind of an idea, and I, the challenge of a new idea is to get the new idea across, uh, but then afterwards, you know, I want you to join me in trying to evaluate, is this a useful way to think? I'm not sure it's a useful way to think. But I think it's an idea, it's going to be challenging. I'm going to explain the idea. It's a challenging to do what we're trying to do. We're trying to understand the mind and uh, how it might work. And uh, I mean, that, that's generally, not just in this talk, but generally we're doing this awesomely difficult thing. And we should just realize that. And uh, um, I, don't know, I don't mean to think that we're super important because we're doing a super difficult thing, but. but um, we should strive to do this super difficult thing and uh, be ambitious. Um, so uh, here I just want to acknowledge that it's so hard and that we should be uh, generous and open-minded, taking ideas from many different fields. Uh, next week, or is it the week after, there's going to be this, this conference on reinforcement learning and decision-making, uh, multidisciplinary conference on reinforcement learning and decision-making, where we bring together people to think about neuroscience and control theory and operations research and reinforcement learning and AI, machine learning, everyone together think about it in all different ways because we need different ways of thinking. And that's what this today's talk is about, a different way of thinking instead of just math and algorithms and equations, which I love. You guys know I'm working on the next edition of the reinforcement learning textbook. And it's all like, you know, full of equations and mathy and intricate stuff. And I think that's really, really important. Uh, but today we're going to try to do something different. We're going to try to think about the the mind is a machine. What would the constraints, what different constraints would come about if we recognize a sort of physicality? Uh, and so, I don't know, uh, uh, I don't think we should think super hard about the brain, but the brain is, is a physical machine, and uh, it's sort of a, a canonical example of, of, um, of this sort of um, <coughs> architectural issues, physicality. Um, so I don't mind if you think that way, but you don't, it's not necessary to think that way. Um, anyway, um, the mind, whether it's a, in, in a brain or some special uh, computer that we've made, it's probably not going to be, it's not good to think of it as a general purpose computer. Uh, it's better, I think, to think of it as like an engine. It's always running, information is flowing through it like a data flow machine or content addressable memory. Not, I don't think it's a general purpose computer. That's what we're all using, but it's not, I, it's not going to be that way when we have the most capable uh, uh, AI machines in the future. So, so let's design the architecture of this mental machine, this outline within which all this stuff is going on. Okay, now from the outside, it's going to look just like reinforcement learning. So just acknowledge that. It won't look any different from the outside. We'll have actions, rewards, and observations. But in the middle, in Let's look inside, okay? And at the center of what's inside, at the center of the mental architecture, is going to be this thing, which is the agent's representation of where it is now. I'm going to call it the agent state or just the state register, okay? This is at the center of the architecture. I'll show you a picture on the next slide, but just let me say, uh, it represents your sense of where you are now, what your current situation is. Uh, think of those big vector, vector features to describe that situation. And then this is used to do everything. This is the input the, the, to, to, for you to pick your actions or to get your value assessment. So here's the picture uh, of the 
first picture, I'm going to show two pictures of the mind, basically the reactive part of the mind and the deliberative part of the mind. And the reactive part of the mind um, has the age of the state register that says where I am now, right here in the middle, okay? And then that is used through the policy to pick your actions, the actions go to the outside of the mind. Okay? Now, uh, so that's clearly, I think, a part of all of ours we might argue might think of an architecture of the brain. There's going to be a part representing where we are, you know, what my senses are, what I remember, where, where my current situation, and based on that, I'm going to pick an action. All of us would maybe uh, design that. It's, it, as I'm drawing it here, it's sort of a more reactive thing. It's not a deliberative thing. It's not like when you play chess or go, where you think for, you know, five minutes about one move. Here, I'm saying our, our mind, as people and animals, uh, have to have the ability to respond rapidly to a changing situation. So as we perceive the situation to be different, we have got to pick a different action. So this is going to be a, a fairly direct map of our policy. Okay, now the agent state has got to be, tell us, you know, if, be based on our, sens our sensors, our observations, our data from the world, and also uh, we might need to remember what our, what, what our actions have been. So these are the things that have been happening picked action, we've seen observations, we also can look at the last three, the last uh, state register, and based on all those things, we update the state register. So this is a, some, this is, this is the piece that I'm showing you here today. There's one more piece, uh, which is the value function. Okay, so the value function is strictly speaking not necessary. Our agent would be complete without the value function. The value function is used to learn the other parts. It's to learn certainly the green part, the policy, and maybe also the other parts. Okay? Now these set of things I'm showing you here constitute the reactive part. Maybe there could also be some other predictions about miscellaneous things in addition to the value function, which is a predictive prediction of reward. Um, but uh, roughly speaking, these are all the things that constitute, these are all the things that have to be done fast. He said all have to be done as fast as you can, uh, as you can respond to, you know, someone poking you in the eye or a tiger uh, jumping, jumping on you from the, from the bushes. Uh, you've got to update your state, pick an action fast, and, and then you've got to be able to... You have to also learn at that speed because, you know, you're doing things all the time. You can't say, oh, I'll learn later because you're going to be doing things later. So, really, you've got to learn at the same... You have to do values and you have to be learning at the same speed. So that's the reactive part of the mind. And uh, the thing that I want you to... The biggest thing I want you to think is, well, at the center of this is the state register. There's some machinery, we don't usually think about the reinforcement learning. This machinery for updating the state register. It's big vector features, where I am. And it's then used to do the most important things we need to do. Okay? Now this is the reactive, this we have settled. This is the state register, it's the place. Oh yeah, it's a place. If you think of this me mechanistically, you know, it's a place. All these wires are going into it. Um, you, the wires that constitute the value function policy, they can't, they can't be redirected elsewhere. Uh, it's like place coding. In, in neuroscience, they call it place coding. Place coding is that the meaning of a signal depends on what wire it's on. It's a place. Okay? So there's a place where your state is. Um, um, so we can't do what we do with our algorithms or our equations, which is say, we have a value function, and I can apply it to this state or some other state. A value function can be applied anywhere. Here it's more like a machine. But if I want to apply the value function to a state, I've got to get the state into this register. OK? So that will become critical in a moment. Um, so that's just the reactive part. Now let's go on to consider the other part, the, the deliberative part. OK? Um, so this is where we don't just jump away from the tiger. But we, uh, we, th we think, we say, well, I could do this, or I could do that, and maybe when I get home, I'll do so and so, you know, plan and thinking. And uh, so, so here we want to disconnect from the world. This is the, the top level view is that the mind consists of these two parts, the reactive part and the deliberative part. The deliberative part, we say, we close our eyes maybe, or we stare off into space, we separate, throw away the actions, we're not going to connect to the world, we throw away the observations, uh, after you throw away the whole state update, we throw away the policy, and we throw away the whole state update. We don't need any of that, and we're just thinking. 
fact, you don't want those to be connected to the world. So detachment. We want to detach from the world and imagine other places we might be and other things we might do and what might be consequences of those likely things in the future. And this gives us kind of a plan. Okay, so let me say that in text first. This is part two of the mental architecture, the more deliberative part. Um, we do planning and imagination. Okay, so we need in planning, we need a model of the world, which we so it's partly the slide is to, is to introduce some words, okay? Model of the world. The model of the world lets us predict what will happen, uh, imagine what will happen in various situations. And I'm going to talk about projection. Projection is where we project to that possible future. And I also going to talk about options. Options, as many of you know, it's a larger sense of, of choice. It's like a, a, a policy for picking actions over some period of time. So it's a, it's a way that you could act for a while. And, and we want to be, so you, we don't just want to be able to predict, like, what if I do this tiny little action, like move my finger a tiny bit. We want to say, well, what if I, you know, uh, walk home, or what if I take a job offer, or what if I, you know, take an airplane to Montreal? Um, so big steps, and, and just ordinary steps, like, you know, uh, picking up an object, or, um, you know, finding someone in the audience. Okay, so, so that's what, an option are these larger steps. And the theory of that's been pretty well worked out. Um, but any kind of planning, you need to compute the value of two states. But the state before and the state after in the projection. You want to say, okay, here's a place I might be. Well, I have a picture. Uh, so here's the sort of normal way of thinking about planning. You have a state that you're thinking about. Maybe that's the state register. And based on that, maybe you'll consider, oh, here's an op option that I might take, a way that I might behave for a while. And so then given where you are and what you propose to do, use your model to project to guess where you're going to end up. Okay? Now, normal planning is a little more complicated because you have to create the reward along the way. That, I, I've abstracted that, that those details away. Certainly, you need these two things. You need to imagine the state you're starting in. Maybe it's the current state, maybe it's some other state. And uh, you need to imagine the state of the result of doing the option. Okay? Obviously, this is true. Okay? Now, remember our value function because we're going to have a problem. The problem here arises is how do we value this state, because you know our value function is valuing the first state, and uh, so this is a problem. This is a problem. How do we value the new state because it's in a different place? If I have some machinery that's looking at that place, it's actually quite difficult to think how you can redirect it to think of this place. Um, if it's because uh, it's the meaning of these individual things. Um, you know, so you might imagine like trying to make the value function compute the value of this, the set of wires about the new place, but that's that's going to be crazy because uh, you're learning. You can have to learn the weights of the value function twice, and then they won't they won't be aligned with each other. You need you need to apply the same value function to these two states, and yet they're in different places, and that's that's the uh, uh, the problem that I want to. Claim you can think about, you can gain access to uh, when you think of it in this more mechanistic, physical sense, where there's places. Okay? But the state and the next state must be in the same place because you want to apply just one function, but they can't be in the same place because um, one is computed from the other. All right, I could, you could think, oh, I have this state and then I, I project forward and I'll like stick it back in the register, but but that's 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 going to have race conditions, and it's, it's you know, while you're computing this thing, you're loading in a new one, it doesn't, you really need two places. You need this to be there, and then compute this one. You need two places. And so that's why I call this try one, because I don't think it works, even though it's the usual way to think about it. I think it doesn't work. I think we must have two state registers, and then that's the challenge. How do you have two? Okay? Now I'll accept, this is a good, if you have any questions, because this, this is the problem that I see. If you don't see this problem, it comes from thinking of it physically, mechanistically. I've always made this picture and I've been happy, but, but now I realize there's going to be a problem if you envision a machine that would do this. Now in our digital computers, we would just take the pointer that 
registers that addresses this register and we point it at that register and then we'd be done. Okay? But that's just because we're used to thinking digital symbolic machines. And with a real machine, um, I don't think that would work. So, so here's the, the, the thing that I think we need to do, and the only interesting thing I'm going to talk about today. Um, we, um, we need to make a second register. And so the idea is here, okay, here we're going to, value will only apply to this register, and uh, we will make a new uh, place where we stick some facts, some information about the state, and then it doesn't have to be an exact copy, it doesn't have to be one for one, it just has to have information about the state, and then it is latched, so to speak, and then we can, from this latch thing, we can use our model to project forward, and we can stick the result safely in the original register, um, because uh, this this is disabled, right? This is because this guy is latched, so we just go forward and we change this guy, and that will not be changing anything else. Um, and so then we have the new state uh, in this in this in the, the state register, the, the primary state register, and then we can apply the value function to it again, and and, uh, and we can do a plan. Um, now one. So let's just, I don't know, let me just say some more about it so to make this concrete a little bit more concrete in your head. You might think, oh, well, there's a problem here because, uh, well, you had your original state, you put a, a sort of a copy of the information about it to a separate register, then you projected forward, overwrote the old state, and, and that's good because this then holds the new state, but you've lost the old state. Now, this isn't a problem that you lost the value of the old state because it would be trivial to write on the side the value of the the old state, it's just one number. And that's all you need from the old state. In order to do the planning, you need the value of the old state. And get the new state, it's value, that's all you need. But what if you, do, you can't now consider doing a different option because you've overwritten your state with the option, I mean, with, with the new state. And so I think you would end up wanting to uh, copy, do a real copy of the, of, the, of the state. This whole vector, just one for one, and so that you could overwrite it and then say, okay, I want to consider a different option. So you load it in from the top. And so you'll do a save and restore on uh, the original overwritten state. So this is the kind of machine that you make up the architecture of the mind. And well, that's the idea. Uh, so I just want to point out that really important here is the agent state. It's the primary thing. You temporarily make a copy, you overwrite it with new. It's like the center of everything. And so, um, very briefly, uh, the state register is central. You could say it's like the seat of consciousness. It's, it is what is occupying your mind at the moment. You know, this is the state you're thinking about. And you know, maybe it's directly connected to the world, like when you're really you're playing tennis or, or doing something really interactive. But then sometimes you're, you're sit back and you think. And uh, it, could be, it could be more detached. So this is the app actually would be happening to the state vector and to the options that you're considering. And you also have to think about how you direct this whole process. There's a lot of things that need to be directed. Okay, and they're sort of like meta processes. They have to be learned. You have to learn like, when should you connect and when should you detach. When should you, you know, say when you play tennis, you want to be connected. When you're when you're thinking about what you're going to do next week, you want to be disconnected, detached. But you know, some machinery has to do that as well. Some meta process. And then when you are detached, you have to decide what to project future or to recall some past states that you can, you can project from it. So which past state do you want to recall? When, when do you want to reload from the copy? Or when do you want to recall some other state? And of course, what option to project with? So anyway, the conclusion is just that this is a different, different I think, a mechanistic way of thinking. And I think it gets us somewhere, uh, uh, somewhere different than we would get when we do our equations and our algorithms. And it's all due to this place coding or meaning being given the, by the wire or the place within the machine. And uh, it would have consequences for the design of mind if we were to take it seriously. So how seriously should we take this as having value? And I don't know. I want to share with you guys and see what you, you, you think of it. Thank you for your attention.
wanted to maybe talk a little bit about your conclusions there. So uh, back in the sort of 1800s, there was this idea of the human brain. There being a tiny homunculus that sits there, pulls all these levers, yeah. and the levers are factory machines, right? Conveyor belts and you know various extractors and things like that. Uh, and so my main concern with all of this that you said here is that we are doing the same thing, except the factory machines are algorithms we are, we've already invented. So there are analogs to value functions, analogs to general value functions. And then you say that there's this higher level mechanism on top that we still need to learn, that we'll figure out where to direct things and so on. And to me, it seems a lot like that homunculus, once again, like that becomes like the person sitting at the console, the tiny person. I don't think that's at this. all a problem, because these high level meta processes, they're, they're like trivial. They're like, you know, oh, should I think? Or should I, uh, or should I, should I connect to the world? They're just, they're, they're, they're what, what they are the, the way the answer should be. The answer to the infinite address of homunculus should be that, well, they get simpler. They, you know, you explain a complex thing by having um, uh, some power, like the planning process is powerful, and uh, but then the control of it is just simple. Or like, you know, it's 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 much like in a uh, like if a chess playing program, you should just you, you have to decide you know, how long to think. Well, the, the process of deciding how long to think, you know, could just be well, so the reason simple. I don't think that works is because the underlying processes that you're talking about here are quite complicated, right? So it seems simple because we have all these proofs that say you ran TD or whatever long enough and it all converges. But in many intelligent algorithms, it's actually really hard to figure out how long you should run something until convergence and so on. So I'm wondering whether the things on top of these things do it. Optimally, I mean, I'm sure we are. We have the same flaws. Like right. Us. It doesn't need to be optimal, but it also doesn't need. It can't be so suboptimal that it never does. Yeah. yeah. Like okay. I'm, I worry that it seems simple because you don't know how to do it. Yet. Seems about right to me. <laughs> Thanks for that. I, I guess we started off with the pessimism, so now we can all go to the optimistic question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm really worried that this none of this. That, that uh, whether we should take this whole thing about place building seriously. Uh, I think I think we want to have a, a basic engine that's running, 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 and and then some controls on top of that, so it's sensitive to experience. Um, and those can be relatively simple. Model three running algorithms, not not deliberate. Yeah. Uh, I sort of have two things I'm wondering about, but maybe I'll just focus on one to start. I hope you have a picture. So uh, I like this idea that you have this kind of independent logic that sort of guides, you know, the reasoning about uh, the possibilities. I mean, that's intriguing. But I was just, I was having trouble accepting the argument that, you know, like the complexity of learning a value function versus the complexity of learning like a copy mechanism or something. And it seems like the copy mechanism is at least as complex, in fact, more complex than the value function. So, well, let me let me argue no, because yeah. I mean, okay, it's what I I, I really imagine uh, a squishy brain machine doing this, okay, and and that's not a bad. I don't think it's a bad thing to think about. Um, so this is some that some uh, vector of, of activities, and uh, you could it would be easy. They they so in order to, to copy and restore, all you have to do is is um, uh, they have to restore their their old value. Okay, so you could do it with. Um, you could do it very physically. You know, it just moves right next to the, uh, each one of these neurons. Could have could have a hardware. Well, uh, it doesn't work in neurons. Each 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 for this bit of hardware, you would have just a, uh, uh, another uh, register right next to it. Okay, and you just move it in and you move it back. Right? It's trivial. The copy actually is trivial. Um, so it doesn't help us with the first problem. The first problem, like. Like we could copy the state in another place. The problem is that the value function looks at one place. And uh, so it doesn't help. Yeah, it's exactly the right question. You know, is the copy uh, a more per permissible activity than, than that two, two value functions, two sets of weights into two different places into the, into the machinery? I, I think it works. 
Yeah, maybe Amy <laughs> just wanted to. Yes. Uh, the second one is maybe misguided, but like I was just thinking about like sort of the nature of these consciousness studies that people do, and you know, you sort of uh, I think you said explicitly you could consider this state register as the seat of like your current conscious state or something. But, but one thing you know, when people might study like that. You know, there's this kind of uh, idea of like, uh, you know, pre-conscious or subconscious sort of localized processing that kind of ignites and becomes sort of globally accessible. And it's hard to reconcile that mechanism with I agree. this kind of design. That kind of meaning of the word consciousness wouldn't apply. Well, I do feel really bad about using the word consciousness at all. <laughs> uh, uh, you, you chose it, I didn't. <laughs> yeah, I really about it. And I, now I'm really regretting it. <laughs> Right. So it is this thing of where you are now and what you're thinking about right now, and uh, so it's, it's that part of it. But it's not all. It's not like the part that you can access verbally, and and all those other meanings of that complicated. Okay. Good. Thanks. Um, yeah. So Martha, welcome back to Alberta. Thanks. This is Martha White. Yay. And Adam White. <laughs> So uh, I, I like this design. Um, it seems to me like you're saying that the state can restore that you have some kind of storage mechanism that you can almost recover some previous states from, and then you have some inactive process that has one main state register. Yeah. So it's part of it is is, is what I was pointing. This is such an important register that it's okay to have special machinery just to store its value and, and restore. Um, so one of the parts I didn't get from the argument is the pseudo copy. Why would we need to copy it? We were just thinking about going What's your name? The copy and the pseudo copy. The pseudo, the real copy, has to restore it point for point. And where's the pseudo copy? See, look at the wires. The the, the value function wires come into this one, and and the model projection wires come into these guys. They're different, and so. When you learn where these wires should go and what the weight should be, um, they're learning on, on this imperfect. Does it, it could just you know it, it can put the information in totally different places. There's no there's no need for it to be relayed in any detail, point to point way to the original uh, state register. Okay, because these weights will be learned on these uh, always on this, never on that. Okay, so the pseudo copy means that you just transferred uh, much of the uh, relevant information that you need to do the projection. And, and yeah, the really key thing is that yeah, the, the pink wires go into there and they never go into that guy. And the red wires that I have actually never go into here. Totally separate those two things. But that's why it could, could make sense. I'm actually completely on board with that, I think. But maybe the difference that I have here is that I'm thinking one of them is a more static thing. You don't just have to say this state. You say many state registers from many times ago, and load whichever ones you feel are most interesting to ask questions about right now. Um, but the pseudocopy seems inelegant to me. I guess I don't like the pseudocopy that much because it doesn't seem necessary. The thing that's going to be talked about. You need but a separate separate place to uh, to hold. That's the rationale for it. Now there is I I I I'm. Um, also have this feeling that you mentioned that you might have uh, many places where you might load the register from. Because, so a key problem in planning is, is not just which options, but which places do you apply to. And, and so that's going to be a, a thing that will require some, some skill or, and you're going to want to work at making the, the choice of the starting places for your projections uh, cleverly. And uh, and then you know, is there algorithms for doing that, like, like uh, prioritized sweeping? And and you can imagine all kinds of things. And like Kenny and I were talking all about recall methods. And like you might have other memories where you you, you uh, stick states you've run into in the past, so you can call back all back and think about them again, right? So uh, I, I haven't put that in, but I'm absolutely thinking about that. Uh, and so I just so this is really like the the, the simplest instance of a save and restore, you might have more interesting save and restores. And, um, and for, for that, I'd have to give maybe a better answer than I gave to Dale. That, you know, here I say, you have this one for one special register, and you stick, stick them in there and restore them. But um, what, what, 
could be imagined you're doing a uh, something that's really like a, a, a memory. This is why I use the word memory for it. Um, you, s you just say these are states that I've seen before, and then reconstruct those that I've seen before. And then they, and that's a whole kind of addressable memory of, of uh, state registers, state vectors that you can re reproduce and, and store them. Say I might want this again, and maybe get them back in a content addressable fashion. Like oh, I remember something about uh, where I parked my car. Uh, tell me the rest of it. Oh, it's up in the tree. carry this idea a lot further in a lot of interesting directions. Probably what you see. That's what we're going to do. Okay. Good. Anything else? Thanks a lot, everybody.